Good morning. So nice to be here with you folks. I've been looking forward to being here with you. And uh, it's a beautiful, cool morning. This morning in uh, December the 27th. Well, maybe I shouldn't say December the 27th. That's what I'm speaking. So we're going to turn, and if I'd like to have you turn with me, to chapter 4 in the book of John, St. John's Gospel. Chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. And your text may read a little different because I'm reading from the King James. And if you have anything other than that, uh, you'll read perhaps a little different with the same meaning is in it. All right? With verse 1, When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, Though Jesus himself baptized not with his disciples, he left Judea and departed again into Galilee, and he must needs go through Samaria. Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour, which means about noon. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then said the woman of, woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, Ask a drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that said to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman said unto him, Sir, Thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. May God ask his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Today I'm speaking on living water. Last week you heard about how John the Baptist and Jesus preached in Judea, or well, taught. He was teaching rather than preaching, I suppose, at that time. And uh, back in the ch previous chapter, verse 22, said that Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Iman near Salim because water was plentiful there and people were coming and being baptized. And you remember the Pharisees who came to John and said, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing all are going to him. So, he replied this way, and I'm reading right in the scripture, verse 29, the latter part of verse 29 of chapter 3. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase but I must decrease. So you see, it wasn't really a 
competition, but it was a cooperative effort, as you heard last week. So the two of them, John continuing in Judea, and Jesus going on. But today, we see that he went on to Galilee. So I'll read verses 1 through 3. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. While Jesus applied himself to te teaching, and his disciples applied themselves, in fact, that he kept them busy doing the baptizing. So uh, he would put honor upon his disciples and also give them something to do. And so he put them to work baptizing. So this teaches us that the benefits of sacraments depends not on the hand that administers them, but the sacrament. In 1 Corinthians 1.17, Paul gave Christ honor. He said, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non effect. And Paul also said in Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Now there's a life lesson. You've heard of life lessons? Life lesson here, and this is it. It is the gospel of Christ, Jesus Christ, which brings salvation, not the eloquence of the messenger who brings it. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ, which brings salvation. Remember that word, salvation? Not the eloquence of the messenger who brings it. So verse 3 says he left and went, uh, he left to deal where John was, and he headed north toward Galilee. It becomes interesting. Verse 4 says he had to pass through Samaria. Or it could say it was necessary for him to pass through Samaria. And it was for this plain reason and no other because it was the only proper road. Samaria lay northward of Judea and beside between the Great Sea of Galilee and Jordan. And there is therefore no going from Galilee to Jerusalem but through this province. Well, Samaria was there. Jesus had to get there. And according to uh, Josephus, he said it was a three days journey. However, although the road through Samaria was the shortest route from Jerusalem to Galilee, pious Jews often avoided it. They did that because there's a deep distrust and dislike between many of the Jewish people and those people that are called the Samaritans. They were sort of half-breeds. That made it way back to 600 years before Jesus. And uh, went way back to the back to Babylonian captivity, and uh, which is also called the Babylonian exile. So a lot of Jews refused to travel through Samaria, so they took that long detour around through Perea, which was east of the Jordan River. <clears throat> All right, during that 600 years, a lot of it happened to the Samaritans. They changed a lot. And they had built their own temple in Yahweh on Mount Gerizim. And they, I think, had built and rebuilt it at times. But 128 BC, the Jews had burned it down. That was about 100 years before Christ. So that obviously would give them a problem. So there's a lot of hostility between the Jews and the Samaritans at this time. However, there's one Bible commentator who said regarding John 4.4, 4, it says that Jesus needed to go through Samaria. Now the need wasn't because of travel arrangements or practical necessities, but because there were people who needed to hear him. So I think we'll agree as we go on. Verses 6 to 7 says, 
So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, tired of us from his journey, just simply sat down beside the well. It was about the six hours of around noon. Well, where is that well? <laughs> well, today the town is named Nablus. My other son, Daryl, and I were there in 1974. Well, Jacob's well is about 250 feet from the ruins of ancient Shechem. So we know it's near Shechem. And even in 1974, we were warned to be cautious of them, especially one old man with red hair. Well, anyhow, Jesus said that. And uh, you know he is right where he should be? He is in the right place at the right time. Isn't he always? Though we do not see him, there's a song that says Jesus is always there. Well, uh, one passage, maybe one verse, and if I have more time at the end, I repeat some of those. The others. Sometimes our skies are cloudy and dreary. Sometimes our hearts are burdened with care. But we may know what error may befall us. Jesus is always there. Never a burden that he doth not bear and carry. Never a sorrow that he doth not share. Whether the days may be sunny or dreary, Jesus is always there. So he's here, even though it's 20 degrees. <laughs> All right. Verse 8 says, For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Now just picture the scene. Here's Jesus along with a woman at the well in the hot midday sun and no one else there to get him a drink just him and her his disciples had gone away to get food they probably would get drink as well so the Samaritan woman uh, said to him after he said the Samaritan woman said to him how is it that you ask a Jew asked for a drink from me a woman of Samaria that was in verse 7 for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritan. That's what she said. So Jesus took this opportune time to, to teach or a witness. Now we were called witnesses when we did this. And it was a teachable moment. There's another life lesson. As disciples of Jesus, we must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading when it comes to those moments or those opportunities, you might call them. When they come along, when we have a chance to share the good news about Jesus. He's truly the water of life. And the title of my message this morning is called Living Water. <laughs> I guess I must be getting over 50. Anyhow. So Jesus said this when she said that. This is his answer. Beautiful. If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, I wonder whether Jesus said it quite that way. But notice here, Jesus ignored what she had said. And he went on and said, and went on to arouse her curiosity. He was coming to the chase. He knew, what his, he knew why, he there, why he was there. So she, like all of us, are so tuned in to our physical needs, the literal needs, that she missed the point. So, uh, he continues. In a way, you'll notice that he sort of turned the tables here when he said that. There's an important word here. If, if you knew the gift of God. So there's a spiritual aspect. We've got right into it now. Turn it, he thought so. I mean, she thought. I would have thought so, not Jesus either. Turning her thinking from the literal world to the spiritual. And so we know here he was referring to salvation, as we'll see later. Remember I mentioned, take a note of salvation? <laughs> and he said, oh, went on to say, and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink. Now, wouldn't that statement cause any one of us to question in our minds? Wouldn't we think about 
about this? Just who does this man think he is? I mean, who can he be? Still, she was thinking in the natural, physical world. Then he goes on and said, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Okay, well, pinpoint that. She still was taking Jesus literally. So she continued with, Sir, you have nothing. Verse 11. Sir, you have nothing to draw water with in the wells deep. Where do you get that living water? And she pointed out the obvious. She saw the physical incapability. He didn't have a rope. He didn't have a bucket. A bucket. And then she gave him a question about that living water. Living water? Perhaps now she was getting the message. Well, anyhow, she went on. Are you greater? I was, Where do you think you are? Okay. Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. So the Samaritans, though they were a mixed race and also had other gods, still claimed ancestry in their property through Jacob, Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh. And I said, the question assumed a negative answer. Then he said, well, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. That's forever life. Notice again, Jesus kept on track with his mission, and he explained the living water, who was himself. The need of it and its benefits. Well, he, kind of, he made a contrast. He said, you drink this, you're going to thirst again. You drink the living water, you'll never be thirsty again. And what? How come? Well, the living water will become, in the last part of that verse, a spring of water welling up forever. Remember Jesus in John 7, 38, and later on in, in, in John 7. <clears throat> he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. When a person accepts Jesus into his or her heart, Jesus becomes that source, that spring, that spring from which rivers of living waters flow continually as he or she feeds on the Word of God. We learned in the earlier teaching about the, with, uh, with love, about the Logos, which is the Word, especially in John 1, that the Word of God and Jesus are synonymous. It says, in the beginning, God was the Word. That's John 1, 1. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In the same chapter, John 1, 14, it reads, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only Son from the Father, Full of grace and truth. Well, we just passed the holiday. Christmas was just a few days ago. And you know, that was a celebration of Jesus being born as a baby. We refer to it as the incarnation. The Word become flesh. Jesus became flesh so we, so he could experience those things that we human beings experience like thirst, as, what, as is illustrated in this lesson. He also suffered pain on Calvary. He was not able, he was, he didn't miss that. In verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so I, I will be, not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. It's all right. Well, you know, people are still thirsty today. Nothing else will satisfy that thirst for God. He desires my fellowship. He desires your fellowship. He loves people. He would love to have us live. Are we loving him back? I'd like to, going back to that, 
song that I mentioned a few moments ago, Jesus is always there. And I'll take that up. Verse 2 says, When in the midst of life with his problems, bent with our toil and burdens we bear, wonderful thought and deep consolation, Jesus is always there. When we are walking through the green pastures, or over the mountains rugged and bare, precious the thought, and sweet the assurance, Jesus is always there. Lo, I am with you always, is written, God will not fail to answer our prayer. Trust in his word. We rest in his promise. <clears throat> Jesus is always there. And again, I'll repeat the refrain, which says, Never a burden that he doth not carry. Never a sorrow. Take a little sorrow for comfort that he is not there. Whether the days may be sunny or dreary, Jesus is always there. That's about our time for today. <coughs> but I would like to take the last few minutes <coughs> To tell you that this woman at the well asked and she received. She received salvation along with many more, as you'll learn next week. The Lord willing, the study will continue next week. And but before I sign off, just a few thoughts and words in closing. John 1 12 and 13 says the words that are so precious. But to all who did receive him, those who received Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right, or he gave the authority, he gave the privilege, he gave the joy. <laughs> I just made my hand in something to that, but you, you know the scripture, you find it. John 1, 12 to 13. To become children of God. At times I just sing, I won't tell you that I do this in the shower, but a song like, I'm a child of the king. Well, there's no one else around to hear me, so I'm sick. <laughs> okay. Now, it goes on to say, who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. There's God's will. And you know, Jesus referred to God as being born again. He told Nicodemus about being born again. Tremendous change comes into our lives. I'm so glad I accepted him as a young fellow, about five years old. I've been very fortunate. But if you have not received Jesus as your sin as yet, and if you would like to do so, I would like to give you a simple prayer that you may follow. And you may pray something like this from your heart. <clears throat> Dear Jesus, I believe you died for me so I could be forgiven. I believe you were raised from the dead so that I could have a new life. I have done wrong things. And I am sorry. Please forgive me for all those things. Please give me your spirit and your power to live for you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name. 
and again. If you pray a prayer from the heart and just receive Jesus into your life, now you'll want to lay a good foundation for your faith so that you'll walk with God in the years ahead. Laying a solid foundation begins with, first of all, reading your Bible. This is a little tag. I have that. I call it my Gideon Bible, but it doesn't have Gideon insignia. It has larger print. So read the Bible. And then you pray. Make prayer a habit. When I get up in the morning, I turn around, sit and put my feet on the floor, I always just thank the Lord for being there. And at my age, I'm over 50 you now. Uh, prayer counts. Jesus hears even the slightest whisper. You can even say prayer if you look at your church. You don't even have to speak it out loud. But you can pray. Just practice prayer. If you need help, pray. So many times, especially today, I might forget something. So now where was that? And I said, Lord, help me. And it comes back. There's sometimes it doesn't. I think he's trying to teach me a lesson. Be a little more careful. But anyhow. The third thing is to find a good church. Find a good church. This course is a good church. And the fourth one is to share your faith. Remember Jesus? I'm sure that gave him great joy to see all those people saved. And I know it did us. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. His shalom to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.